piece of paper. Not much. You're very welcome here. Good evening. I'm Rob Stavens, a professor of public policy here at the Kennedy School of Government, and I'm delighted to welcome you to the forum this evening. Tonight's program was both organized and is also sponsored by a number of student interest groups, so I want to begin by identifying those student interest groups who have put a lot of time into this. Uh, the Institute of Politics Student Advisory Committee, the Kennedy School's Environment Policy Interest Council, the Harvard Business School's Environmental Club, and Harvard University's University-wide Environmental Action Committee. I think it probably can be said that the Bush administration, the prior administration, may well have been the first to recognize, at least publicly, to recognize the very tight linkage, explicitly, the very tight linkage and connection between environmental policies on the one hand and economic conditions on the other, when it insisted in the 1990 economic report of the president that economic growth is a necessary condition for environmental improvement. The Clinton administration, and I should probably say in this area the Clinton-Gore administration, has carried that recognition much further, of course, by focusing on what we might consider to be the opposite direction of causality, as when President Clinton in his 1993 Earth Day speech described, quote, environmental protection as a necessary condition for economic welfare. In either case, what it's certainly fair to say is that the perception and the public pronouncements from policymakers of the linkage between the economy and the environment has certainly never been greater than it is today. And that means that this evening's discussion among this group should not only be interesting, but it should also be highly relevant. The economy and the environment, are they compatible? Uh, is it wrong, in other words, to assert that there are trade-offs between environmental protection on the one hand and economic well-being on the other? Is it, as Vice President Gore and many others have said, a false dichotomy to talk about that? Tonight, in order to address that question of compatibility or complementarity and a whole host of related questions that I'm sure many of you will bring up, we're fortunate to have with us what is truly a very distinguished panel. Uh, I'm going to introduce each of them to you in turn before they speak because I'm going to begin the evening. We're going to begin by giving, giving each of our panelists an opportunity to take just a few minutes to outline for you, for all of us, their basic perceptions of the answer to the fundamental question of the evening. Are economy and environment compatible? And then after a bit of discussion among the panelists, we're then going to proceed quite directly to questions uh, from all of you and further discussion. We begin with David Hawkins, who is a senior attorney at the Natural Resources Defense Council. As most everyone here, or many of you here probably know, NRDC, as it is called, is one of the leading environmental advocacy groups in the United States, and for that matter, in the world. Since 1971, Dave has been an attorney at NRDC, although he did take a brief sojourn, some time off from NRDC, during the Carter administration, to serve as the assistant administrator for what was then called Air, Noise, and Radiation at the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, although he mentioned to me earlier that it is now called, as we know, Air and Radiation because a deregulatory initiative of the Reagan administration was to eliminate noise as a program, not as a problem necessarily. <laughs> so with that, let me turn first to Dave Hawkins. Well, thank you, and I won't hold you in suspense. I do believe that the economy and environmental protection are, uh, are compatible. Uh, now that the suspense is gone, uh, I'll make uh, a couple of points. Um, uh, the, uh, the first is that uh, certainly at the, at the firm level, uh, there are no free lunches, particularly in the short term. Uh, and uh, being asked to internalize costs that up to now you have been externalizing uh, happily uh, is going to prov pro provoke some change and it's going to require you to invest some uh, 
dollars and time and person power in uh, objectives that you haven't been paying attention to uh, before. And that may affect uh, short-term performance. Uh, but in our view, these, in fact, are short-term phenomena. Uh, what environmental uh, requirements do is introduce a design constraint. Uh, and it's a design constraint which has been ignored uh, because uh, the peculiarities of whatever market was operating didn't require them to be considered. So the design constraint is either imposed on the, uh, on the manufacturing processes or on the products themselves or on both. Uh, I think the, the old fashioned view would be to say that's always going to result in some uh, loss to the economy. Uh, but I think that experience shows that the contrary is often the case and in the long term almost inevitably will be the case. Um, that once a design constraint is imposed, uh, that uh, resources will be expended to figure out ways of cheap, uh, cheap, more cheaply uh, meeting that, uh, that design constraint. Um, and this poses a challenge to uh, standard setting or decision making, because typically what happens in a debate over what kind of an environmental objective to set, whether it's Congress or uh, some other legislative branch, the arguments come forward this is going to be impossibly expensive. Look at what it'll cost. And all sorts of uh, analyses are trotted out that show what the cost will be. And then the more sophisticated of them trot out analyses saying the benefits won't nearly be commensurate with these projected costs. Well, among the many problems with those uh, analyses is uh, the fact that typically those costs will turn out to be overstatements, not because they're made by liars necessarily, but because they're made by uh, conservative estimates of how much it will cost to do something that somebody hasn't thought sufficiently about how to do up to that point. And typically, off-the-shelf types of responses will not be optimized. Only once the target has been established as a real target are the resources freed up to actually focus on how to do it and how to do it more cheaply. And that, I think, will be the process that, uh, that emerges over time. Uh, uh, sensible economic actors are going to realize that the world is going to demand cleaner products and it's going to demand cleaner processes. And by investing money in both of those things, you will have a more flexible, available product which uh, is going to uh, have more markets open to it. Thank you. We're now going to move from the perspective of uh, environmental advocacy and environmental advocacy organizations to government. And it, we're doing that in the person of Richard Morgenstern. Dick is the director of the Office of Policy Analysis at the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency in Washington, a position that he's held since 1982. Uh, during that period of time, uh, during the Bush administration, under then Administrator Bill Riley, he also served for a substantial period of time, as it turned out, as the Acting Assistant Administrator for the Office of Policy Planning and Evaluation and also as the Acting Deputy Administrator. Prior at his time to uh, EPA, we should confess, and some other government assignments, he was a professor of economics at Queens College. Dick Morgenstern. Thank you, Rob. <clears throat> if we require steel mills to reduce their uh, coke oven emissions, or if we require refiners to reduce the leaded content of their gasoline, then we inevitably drive up the costs of steel or gasoline. If we looked simply at these increased costs, then we would conclude that there was a clear trade-off between the economy and the environment. But if we also looked, for example, in the case of lead and gasoline at the benefits, like uh, reducing the lead poisoning of kids, which of course reduces uh, medical costs, if we looked at the reduction in air emissions from cars, if we looked at the reduced maintenance uh, required of engines, plus some other types of damages, then we would uh, conclude that reducing lead and gasoline was on net beneficial to the economy. That is, in this instance, we would conclude that there was no trade-off, but in fact a clean environment and a strong economy were complementary to one another. One problem we have is that the most common measure of economic welfare, namely gross domestic product, doesn't include the value of most environmental amenities, like clean air and clean water. There's no doubt that these amenities have value. Um, and certainly, there's many surveys that indicate that, and certainly the lead analysis I mentioned uh, demonstrates that. Um, there's the, on the other hand, gross domestic product includes certain activities that we would prefer to exclude. 
like oil spills and Superfund cleanups. Thus, step one is to get clear terms of discourse. When we ask, is there a trade-off between the economy and the environment, we need to take a comprehensive look at the situation. We need a holistic measure like green GDP, which includes a full accounting of both natural and environmental resources. The good news is that the Commerce Department has begun to calculate such a measure. The bad news is that we're still a long ways from being able to count the full range of effects that we're concerned with. In the meantime, there's no excuse for good judgment on the part of our elected and appointed officials charged with making these decisions. The holistic green GDP approach is useful for framing the issues. Step two is to try to advance those environmental policies that involve as little of a trade-off as possible when using the conventional measures, and presumably no trade-off when using a truly comprehensive green GDP approach. Fortunately, a number of opportunities exist. For example, the Kennedy School's Dale Jorgensen has done pioneering work which shows that taxing pollution rather than wages and capital can improve both environmental quality and the economy at the same time. Analyses suggest that reforming existing policies in the area of road financing, parking, energy and agriculture subsidies, and water and natural resource management all hold the promise of improving both the economy and the environment. Other opportunities exist in the areas of pollution prevention through economic policies, such as providing information and technical assistance to smooth market operations. EPA's Green Lights program would be an example, and also uh, programs that provide information on pesticide and fertilizer effectiveness would be other examples. Promoting green trade policies through GATT reform. Streamlining regulatory policies in such areas as communication, where information networks are used to increase controls and reduce waste. Using government policy to accelerate research, development, and deployment of more efficient and less polluting capital. And in general, using flexible economic instruments to achieve environmental goals. My final point, sure, it's possible to make mistakes which do lead to a significant trade-off between the economy and the environment. And it's certainly true that we have made some such mistakes over the years. As Carl Craner notes in his recent book, we have both overregulated and underregulated at the same time. <clears throat> but if you take a full account of the benefits of, the, of our actions, a la the Green D, uh, GDP measure, and especially if you're creative in searching for opportunities, for example, in the area of tax policy, then we can expect a long string of win-win situations. Thank you. Having heard from a government perspective, one government perspective, we're now going to move to hear from one business or private industry perspective. Uh, someone who is surely uh, exceptionally well positioned to provide that perspective is uh, Bradley Whitehead. He's a partner at McKinsey and Company, the world's largest management consulting firm. And perhaps more important is the fact that Brad co-directs McKinsey's new North American environmental practice. Uh, also, although I'm not describing the educational background of our other participants, I cannot hesitate, I cannot resist mentioning that Brad is both a graduate of Harvard College and of the Kennedy School of Government. Uh, he is also the co-author uh, of an article forthcoming in the Harvard Business Review of all places, which is titled, It Is Not Easy Being Green. Brad Whitehead. Thank you. Should we be doing more for the environment? Uh, as a concerned citizen, I must answer that question with an emphatic yes. I happen to live in the state of Ohio, which is one of the tops in the nations in terms of its toxic emissions, according to the recently released toxic release inventory. I also live in the city of Cleveland, where the EPA tells me that it's unsafe for my children to swim in the beaches near my home, and I'm fearful of serving the local fish at our backyard barbecues. There are indeed important and pressing environmental issues that must be addressed. And I, for one, am a citizen who's willing to step up and pay for what we must do. But that's not the question that's before us tonight. Instead, we are looking at the question of whether the environment and the economy are really compatible. Or stated differently, do we indeed have to pay for the environmental improvements that we so need? According to the uh, false dichotomy or false choice apologists that Rob Stevens described, what is good for the environment is good for the economy. Tight regulations will spur job growth, 
and enhance competitiveness. Now, many go on to argue that the false dichotomy extends to individual businesses as well, and that it is in a corporation or company's financial self-interest to be environmentally proactive. In essence, what these false choice apologists are offering us is a free lunch in the environment. We can get those improvements we so desperately need without having to give up anything in terms of profits, jobs, or competitiveness. So the question becomes tonight, is there a free lunch in the environment? Well, I for one tend to be skeptical of people who offer me something for nothing. And my experience in working with clients across a variety of industries and geographies down in the trenches suggests to me that the environment is no exception to that case. Now, what I should emphasize, though, is that my perspective is primarily from a company and industry-specific perspective and level, and one can and should also examine this question from an economy-wide and societal level. And where there is, I think, evidence that's beginning to suggest that the environment still is, at an aggregate level, uh, still a relatively small issue that gets lost in the noise with respect to other drivers of productivity and competitiveness. With that said, however, for individual companies and specific businesses, the environment can matter a great deal, and it is at this level where I think the false choice argument is its most dangerous. Now, the argument that the false choice apologists offer is, is, are, are multitudinous and as to why the environment and the economy are not at odds for individual <coughs> businesses. And I hope we'll get the chance to explore some of those in the discussion that follows tonight. But for the moment, let me just touch upon one of those, which is particularly pervasive uh, which I have some degree of familiarity from my client work. And this argument holds that tight environmental standards will improve profitability because they're going to wring inefficiencies out of the production process and thereby reduce costs. And since waste is an inefficiency, eliminating it will improve productivity and thereby pro profitability. Now that argument has a great ring to it. But unfortunately, the facts simply don't bear this one out. And certainly the press has been full, chock full indeed, of pollution prevention programs and how profitable those have been for companies. Unfortunately, their focusing on this sort of deed and action is simply a case of selective vision. An example that many love to cite is that of the Dow Chemical Program, uh, Dow Chemical Company and their program called the RAP, which stands for Waste Reduction Always Pays. The RAP program is a bottom-up pollution prevention program of employee-generated ideas that earned a 55% return on investment in 1992, and the number was even higher in 91. That would seem to support the false choice argument. However, when you couple those impressive returns to all the corporate environmental projects, the return fell to a negative 16%. In other words, it lost a great deal of money. What I don't argue, though, is that win-win opportunities do not exist. In fact, they do. However, because of their relative size and rarity, they will almost certainly be overshadowed by the total cost of a company's environmental program and become insignificant in the face of all the enormous expenditures that will never generate a positive return. Now, that's not to say that en enormous opportunities don't exist in the environment to do things better. And on this point, I'm extremely optimistic because the real challenge for us as a society, as business people, and as policymakers is to think about how to better manage life in the trade-off zone of the economy and the environment. Because while there may be no free lunch in the environment, the environmental lunch we seek can cost us a heck of a lot less. And in our work with companies, for instance, we have found tremendous opportunities to do things better by thinking more carefully and strategically about the environment and by managing expenditures more rigorously. This, we believe, should be an exciting and energizing news for companies and the public and should allow us to get to the aspirations uh, that we hold for the environment. Thank you. We're now going to move uh, from my left to my right, but only geographically do I suggest that. Uh, we're going to go from private industry now to the fourth estate, in particular the New York Times. Uh, since 1989, Peter Passell has been a columnist and a reporter at the Times, where he has frequently covered environmental stories, both in his Sunday, pardon me, his Thursday uh, economic scene column, as well as in his frequent reporting for the paper. Prior to that, from 1977 until 1989, he was a member of the editorial board of the New York Times. And before that, he too was a professor of economics. In his case, he was at Columbia University. Peter Passell. Uh, 
Thank you. It, you know, there's a problem coming fourth here, though, though, uh, though poor Paul Portney has a problem coming fifth, I suppose, even worse problem. Um, a, a, lot of, a, lot of, a lot of the wind has been taken out of my sails, but I'll, I'll still endeavor here. Um, first of all, let me reiterate, in a very formal sense, uh, the economy, uh, the, there, is no there is no conflict between economic values and environmental values. Um, uh, it's just as good to get rid of bad things as it is to create good things. I mean, they're a, a, a bad is a negative good thing. Um, so that in a proper accounting structure, in the great accounting system in the sky, uh, you always increase the GDP if you make a good decision about the environment. Uh, it's that easy, that, but of course it isn't that easy. We don't know what the good de decisions are. Uh, let's start with that. That's, that's the easy part, though we don't know what the good decisions are, and we don't really have good ways to make them. The other side of this, which I really find close to offensive, though I think I understand what's going on, is that the Clinton administration spent a great deal of time explaining to us that the environment is good economics. It creates jobs. Well, when I, um, it, like what Himmler used to say, when I hear the word culture, I reach for my gun. When I, um, as an economist, when I hear the word creating jobs, I reach for my gun, too. Um, I hate the notion that the object of economics is to create jobs. If we wanted to create jobs, all we'd have to do is make it illegal to use electronic switches for telephones. Um, there'd be jobs for something like a half a million telephone operators. That would be really great, wouldn't it? Um, I'm being deliberately provocative here. Uh, I d there, is, there is just no rationale. There's nothing rational about the notion that we, but by lowering productivity uh, and thereby creating jobs, we've done something good for ourselves. We haven't. Uh, we may be pretty lousy at employing people at the margin in the economy, but I assure you uh, uh, we're not going to employ the people who are marginal in the economy uh, by, uh, through environmental programs. A um, couple other thoughts here. Um, economists are not perfect on these subjects either. Even though I think that they, they're closer to wisdom than most folks, they, they, um, they too fall into a, a couple of interesting traps. One of them is they, they like tangible benefits more than intangible benefits. I talked about earlier about the great accounting system in the sky. Well, where do the, um, where do the penguins fit into that great accounting system in the sky? What's a penguin worth? I don't have the faintest idea. Um, but somehow we have to think about whether, actually penguins are endangered, it's a bad example, but say sea otters. Sea otters are endangered and when you spill oil on them they get all mucked up and die, you know, and, it's, and I feel bad and I'm sure you feel bad too. But how much is it worth to you? We really don't have a way to say. Um, but economists, Economists are really interested in this problem and are even coming up with solutions, which I think I, I suspect Paul Portney at some point may talk about, and I suspect you're really bad solutions. One minute left. Okay, the other bad thing economists do is that they like to, they like to make the systems more, they, they, like, they like to get places very fast, as efficiently as possible, and they don't think a whole lot about which direction they're going. Um, one quick example. We, uh, economists spent a great deal of time triumphing in producing an, an emissions trading system for acid rain, for sulfur. I, I wrote enthusiastically about it, but, I, but nobody thought much about what the goal was, whether the, the, r the right number of tons were removed or too many tons were removed or not enough tons will be removed. We, for all we know, we built a very efficient train to get to the wrong place. Uh, I'm done. <laughs> I'm sure you're not done, Peter. <laughs> uh, ha having heard from uh, an environmental advocate, a government official, a private industry, consultant and a journalist, we finally turn, of course, to an academic. Uh, Paul Portney is vice president and a senior fellow at Resources for the Future in Washington, D.C. For those of you who do not know it, let me just state for the record that RFF is generally considered to be the world's leading uh, economic, or pardon me, environmental economics and policy think tank. Paul, in addition to his work at RFF, has also served at the Council on Environmental Quality during the, in the White House during the Carter administration. And he has taught at the University of California, Berkeley, and at Princeton. He is currently the co-chairman of the Environmental Economics Committee of the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency's Science Advisory Board. Paul Portney. Rob, thank you very much. Uh, leave it to an academic to embroil everything in confusion for the end of the program. Um, uh, let's go back to the question that was posed. Is there a trade-off between the environment and the economy? Uh, the answer is an unequivocal no and yes. Uh, <laughs> let me start with the no because that case is easiest to make. Um, simply at the statistical level, 
Between 1970 and 1990 in the United States, real disposable personal income per capita, which is probably the best measure of what individuals have available to spend, increased 42% over that 20-year period. During that same 20-year period, urban air quality improved, depending on the pollutant that we look at, between 10 and 95%, and virtually every other environmental measure that one can think of, not every last one, but virtually every last one, also improved during that same 20-year period, though less dramatically than urban air quality. So it's clearly possible for economic growth to coexist at the same time the environment gets better. Uh, let me turn to the way this debate between the economy and the environment is usually posed, however, and that has to do with job creation or job loss. The best example of this was the 1992 presidential election, uh, where not so much candidates Clinton and Bush, uh, so much as vice presidential candidates Quayle and Gore, staked out diametrically opposed view on this, views on this. Uh, with then Vice President Quayle suggesting that every time a regulation was put in place, factory doors slammed shut and people went and stood in soup lines. By the same token, though somewhat less starkly, I think Vice President then candidate Gore um, gave the impression that environmental protection had the potential to create uh, hundreds of thousands of jobs and lead the United States economy out of the recession. And I think there's an element of, of confusion to both of those arguments, if I may. Uh, let me say three things about the connection between jobs and the environment. Um, first of all, environmental regulation will never affect the total level of employment in the United States very much at all. Um, this is going to be de determined by domestic and international fiscal and monetary policy, and particularly in the United States, uh, the level of investments in our labor force that we're willing to make. Um, in the short term, regulation can create or destroy jobs, but I put those terms in parentheses in the long term, it's not going to make much difference. Second, currently, the environmental industry in the United States, which numbers about a million people, is relatively small compared to the overall size of the economy. By the way, of those million people, about 500,000 spend their days perched behind the wheel of garbage trucks because those people are counted as part of the environmental <laughs> industry in the United States as well. It's the biggest part, solid and hazardous waste removal. Um, now, that's not to say that we shouldn't be proud of this industry and the favorable balance of trade that it generates and hope that it gets bigger and that that balance of trade grows, but I would make the perhaps controversial statement that if the United States had to choose between world dominance in the environmental control industry and world dominance in autos, chemicals, steel, or agriculture, we'd be out of our collective minds to choose the former rather than any of the latter. Um, third and finally, jobs are a lousy way to keep score when we're trying to evaluate public policy, and this is the point that I think Peter Passell just made. Both you and I can think of very, very good environmental regulatory programs from a social perspective that might result in factories closing their door and people at least temporarily losing jobs. By the same token, any of us, any of us here can think of environmental regulatory programs that in the short term would create all kinds of job opportunities but if they didn't do anything for the environment, nevertheless would have to be judged lousy environmental programs. Well, if you can't use jobs to keep score in making decisions about public policies per pertaining to the environment, um, what do we do? Well, my recommendation is a kind of common sense benefit cost analysis. Not necessarily putting everything into dollars and cents, because I think that's very difficult to do, but rather asking ourselves this question. Do the good things that result from this policy outweigh the bad things? common sense benefit cost. Now having said that, that implies that there's always a cost to an environmental regulatory program. And like Brad Whitehead earlier, I believe that there is. Even in those cases where a regulatory program forces a firm to meet a standard, in the process they discover, hey, we can actually make more money than we were making before because it took the government to show us that we were stupid. Even in those cases where it appears there's no cost to a regulatory program, there is a cost. And that's the opportunities that the, that the firm foregoes by spending on the environment rather than spending money on training the labor force, expanding the capital stock, or investing in more R&D. In that sense, there will always be a cost to environmental regulation. The benefits are often worth that cost, but a paradigm that suggests that we can have more environmental protection and give up <coughs> nothing someplace else, I think is, is bound to frustrate and deceive the public, and I think we deserve better than that. We're going to begin to take uh, questions from all of you in just a, a few minutes. But first, since our panelists have been so admirably brief and concise in their initial comments, I'm going to give an opportunity to our panelists to take just one minute each, if they like, 
you do not have to exercise this option, starting with Dave Hawkins, to respond to a few of the things we heard, and then we will quickly go to questions. Well, just one uh, brief uh, response uh, to the point Paul made about choosing between the uh, pollution control uh, market and, uh, and the uh, market for electronics or autos. I, I think that suffers from an overly narrow definition of, uh, of the green market. When I'm talking about a green market, I'm talking about products such as electronics or autos, which uh, deserve a wider market and achieve a wider market because of their environmental attributes. Uh, Siemens, for example, is very busy working on televisions, which will be uh, televisions that can be taken apart and the parts can be reused rather than being trashed. Uh, they're aiming for a market where this is going to make sense, uh, and, and that's the kind of, uh, of integrating into the design of products. It's not a pollution <coughs> control project, but it is a product that is, it, that is designed with environmental considerations in mind from the very beginning. Dick, do you have anything? Yeah, I'll just pick up on one point. I think Brad made a very interesting observation that at the firm level, his experience in working with companies is that uh, they often experience, or almost uh, almost uh, universally, experience environmental regulations as being negative. And if you contrast that with what I said, that there were many opportunities in the aggregate to have win-win situations, you might at least superficially see a, uh, a contradiction, but I don't think there is one. I think that, uh, that is to say, at the firm level, there are many uh, costs that are born, and they do directly uh, impact uh, firms' well-being, certainly. Uh, I don't think that's in dispute. There are also cases where firms have come out ahead, but in the aggregate, I don't think at the firm level, they added up all the firms just at that level, I think you'd inevitably uh, see real costs. But I think that we as a society value a lot more things than those which show up on the uh, P&L statements of firm. And I think that's where the opportunities for the win-win really occur. And I think the fact that we have opportunities to reduce health costs, for example, by reducing pollution, that's not directly going to show up on the bottom line. Uh, and many other uh, type examples I would mention. Brent? Uh, I'd just like to come back to one comment that Dave made that then Paul touched on just at the end of his remarks, which was that strict environmental standards will be an impetus uh, for companies to think outside the box and to spur innovation. Because while I think that that is probably true, uh, in our work with companies, what we find is that we're constantly looking for ways uh, to re-engineer products and processes and typically the environment is just one of about 10,000 uh, possible stimuli to get that accomplished, and uh, seldom is it the best stimuli. And uh, just one example to come back to Paul's point is that at one of my clients, we went through and we sort of did the survey of how people were spending their time, and what we found was that nearly 70% of the time of the process engineers in the factory uh, were spending their time on environmental initiatives, which you and I may argue that that's exactly what we want them to be doing, uh, but that was time not spent on other higher return opportunities to improve their processes. And so um, we could argue that this is good for them to do for a lot of reasons, but I, I'd be hard pressed to agree to an argument that says that that's an otherwise sort of value maximizing strategy for a company like that. Peter. Uh, just one point. I would add uh, another thought about the cost of regulation which is that, uh, that it corrupts capitalism. Uh, and it's a very important thought, I, I think it is, um, that, that we, we, we've created corporate cultures that, that have to worry about, properly have to worry about, about the world outside them, but there's a cost to it too, which is they, get, they specialize it and get very good at it. Um, and we, all, we, know from, we know from the past that the companies that are the very best specialists at dealing with the government, namely defense contractors, are also the least efficient. <coughs> so that there's, some broad sense in, in which we want to minimize regulation because we don't want corporate cultures to change to become more, more bureaucratic and more like government. Paul. Oh. I pass. Oh. <laughs> Sterling fellow. Uh, we're now going to begin to take questions uh, from the floor, from the two microphones on either side. And let me remind you, since uh, nearly everyone here came to hear from the panelists, that questions are welcomed. Uh, brief questions and not speeches. So let me start over here and I'll go back and forth. Sir, and if you could direct it to someone in particular, although I suspect that nearly everyone will want to chime in. Yeah, I'm not sure I can direct this to someone in particular. Okay. Um, I think a lot of interesting things have been raised here, but it seems like uh, 
in a broad sense, you're all sort of agreeing with each other. Um, and I, I come to that conclusion uh, by thinking about the definitions that we're using. I, I think um, our definition of free lunch, our definition of uh, what's economic and what's environment is, is very slippery. And I've seen a couple different definitions come out. Um, I, I want to know to what extent you think you're actually agreeing with each other definitions aside. Um, and if there may be disagreements at the margin, how serious those are. Are you disagreeing with each other, Paul? Um, one of the things I was going to say before I decided to pass and give you all the floor was that I think there is a remarkable uh, uh, amount of agreement here. Nevertheless, I guess I would take issue with one of the phrases that several of the panelists have used so far, and that's win-win. This is one of my least favorite terms because I can't think of a single public policy problem where every single person comes out a winner. Think about what appears to be a win-win thing where we want to reduce sulfur dioxide pollution in the United States and save money at the same time. There's an easy way to do that, and that's to do away with requirements that coal-fired power plants use particular kinds of technology to do it and give them the flexibility to use energy conservation or shifting to low sulfur coal to meet that target. Indeed, after all, isn't that a win-win? We could even get more environmental quality and less cost on the part of the power plants. No, if you sell high sulfur coal, you lose under a policy that gives power plants the flexibility to shift to low sulfur coal. And I'm just concerned that, that we, as a society, have become transfixed by this notion of win-win and don't realize that there's, I, I can't think of a single public policy issue where we can easily do something that will enhance the good, save ourselves money at the same time, and not make at least one economic actor worse off. It's because we don't want to face the fact that there are trade-offs associated with every single thing that we do, and I don't think we should be ashamed of that. It's a, it's a direct result of the fact of the scarcity of resources. David and Dick, there's no such thing as a win-win situation in environmental policy, that is. Well, I. I I, I tend to agree with Paul on that, uh, but I want to I want to answer the questioner, which was, are there places where we disagree? And and uh, I think there are. I think that some of us probably feel that we are moving too slowly on environmental protection, and others may feel that we're moving too rapidly. Um, and uh, I think that disagreement, in part, may turn on a disagreement about what uh, we think are the consequences to the economy of a more aggressive. Uh, uh, environmental protection policy and what we think the benefits are. Um, and uh, certainly the organization I work for feels that we perennially undervalue the benefits that we can get from well-designed environmental protection programs. And we simply fail to calculate those. And having been uh, an, a, uh, a reviewer when I uh, had my government bureaucrat on, hat on of agency <coughs> regulatory impact analyses, I can tell you that even in um, a relatively liberal democratic administration, maybe particularly so, there is a real uh, desire not to be accused of overstating the benefits. And uh, so there is a conservatism that is built into these analyses in order to be respected, in order to be taken seriously uh, in forums like this and elsewhere. Don't come up with flaky uh, pie in the sky calculus uh, of, uh, of benefits. Have hard numbers that everybody can agree on. And that's something that does, in my view, cause these benefits to be understated and cause the government to move less aggressively than it should. The lines are growing, so I'm actually going to go to the next question, please. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> this is about the NAFTA agreement and uh, the relationship between environmental concerns and international economic development. Um, it, oh, well, as a, Mexican, I'm, uh, as a Mexican student, I'm very interested in, on, on the topic, and I would like to ask you uh, whether you think that <clears throat> the environment should be linked to American foreign policies related to international development, and uh, whether you think that a better policy might be perhaps to be more um, uh, concerned about the conduct of American multinational enterprises, given that they play such an important role uh, in economic uh, development for several countries. So should environmental policy be linked together with uh, development policy and with trade policy? Yeah, it seems to me that it wasn't that much a good, a sensible policy to, I mean, the way it was, um, the way the environment was 
incorporated into a NAFTA mm -hmm. debate. Okay. Um, it, it seems to me that a better policy would yeah. be to have multi American multinational enterprises to be more um, responsive to the environment. And Thank you. Yeah. Uh, can someone uh, take that first? This, this is a question, <laughs> I think, on which the answers will disagree. The last question, or you, you'll get, be satisfied now. Well, I spoke last, but I'll speak quickly. Uh, the environmental side agreements were put in there as a safeguard, uh, a safeguard, among other things, uh, against practices by American multinationals uh, that might operate uh, in, in an environment in Mexico that would uh, allow them to, uh, to uh, cut near-term costs by, in effect, getting a subsidy in the form of, uh, of cheaper uh, waste disposal practices. So. Uh, I don't think it's an either-or uh, situation, and, and yes, I do think that, uh, there, that the U.S. needs to be out there formulating uh, policies that deal with both international uh, economic development and, and environmental policies uh, and sort of the flip side of, of GATT. Um, there, are, uh, there are GATT uh, rules against uh, dumping uh, and uh, GATT rules against tariffs. And we should be more active in looking at forms of environmental dumping, dumping products uh, because of uh, that are in effect subsidized by uh, by lax pollution controls. Other perspectives from this one? Well, um, I, I'm very unhappy. I mean, I think you could probably find specific incidences where it'd be nice to to, to, to use some muscle on somebody. You know, I mean, this is a, a little bit like human rights. I think that I really do. I really feel bad for the for the dolphins in Thailand. Um, you know. I, uh, you know, c you can hit me viscerally like everybody else. I think it's real bad to mix up trade and the environment, except where the environmental issues are truly international. If the pollution is going to come over the border, it's our business. Or if it's going to change the, the atmosphere of the world, it's our business. The problem is that once you start down this line, there's no limit. Uh, why not have a minimum wage? Um, it, it's really terrible that people work for so little money in Brazil. Let's, let's, uh, let's, not, let's refuse to trade with them unless they have the same minimum wage we do. Um, I think that Ultimately, this is real bad stuff, that the whole logic of trade is to exploit differences in cultures as well as, as, well as economic endowments, uh, in economic cultures as well as economic endowments. So, no, I don't, I don't like it at all. Paul? I think we have to distinguish between two cases, and Peter has helped shed a little bit of light on this. Uh, in the case where one country is polluting and that pollution is spilling over into another country, and this is typically the case for serious air pollution and water pollution problems, then I think the receiving country does, has to th does have to think about using trade policy, diplomacy, uh, environmental policy, and negotiations as a way to protect itself. The much harder question, of course, and the question that came up in NAFTA is, suppose a developing country with a much lower standard of living than the United States is willing to accept a lot of pollution within its own boundaries that doesn't spill over to some other country. Because they have a low standard of living, they have a less developed taste for environmental protection in the same way the United States had a lower taste for environmental protection 20 or 30 years ago before we experienced rapid economic growth. In a case like that, I think it's difficult for the United States to say to a country, you should have the same high standards that we do, even though your standard of living is 1 20th that in the United States. And I just think that's a much more difficult issue to wrestle with. Next question. You've partly answered my question. I wanted to ask, um, it seems to me that it's in the developing world where the real trade-offs are to be made between mm. um, development, economic development, and environmental protection. And I'd like the panel to comment on that and also to say whether you think that we have the right to expect developing countries to meet higher environmental standards when they have a lot of problems like poverty to combat first. I think Paul just answered that question precisely, so let's see if there's someone who wants to disagree with what Paul's answer was to it. Yeah, I think there are a number of ways of handling different problems. Um, for example, the way we've handled the uh, CFC uh, problem is essentially for the rich countries of the world to uh, directly compensate the developing countries so that they will convert to a substance that is, uh, in this case, safe for the ozone layer. And I think as we deal, for example, with the uh, global climate problem, we're likely to see perhaps a similar or a related type of approach. I think in other cases, there is a threat that we might use uh, trade sanctions. And obviously, in fact, trade sanctions are actually part of the Montreal Protocol as well, so they could be part of that. But I think that there are different solutions that are going to emerge for different types of environmental problems. And uh, I don't think there's going to be a simple answer uh, that we'll come across. I do have a quick comment. We don't have the right to do this, uh, uh, to take this position with other countries, but I, I think that the U.S. and other countries have the responsibility to aspire to a, a global 
uh, Commonwealth of Nations that does, in fact, allow countries like our own to have policies which uh, have high environmental standards and avoid the choice of uh, being faced with the argument that all of the, all of the jobs in the U.S. are going to go overseas because of those, uh, those high environmental standards. That doesn't mean that we, we stra uh, stagger around and, and say we have the right to tell the developing countries they must have these standards, but surely we should participate in a system that uh, helps countries move forward and uh, improve their uh, quality of life, and, and if it involves, uh, 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 in effect, uh, international transfers uh, of, of economic wealth to, uh, to allow this to happen faster, then we should consider that. Can we go to the... I was going to respond to that one as well, just from a corporate perspective. I think there is a role here uh, for, for corporations in developing countries as well, because while it may be a form of moral imperialism for a government to go and lay um, some sort of restrictions on what an individual country uh, does or doesn't do, um, it's intriguing to see what some of the industry associations have done, most notably the Chemical Manufacturers Association with its Responsible Care Program, which says what a chemical company does anywhere in the world affects the rest of us in the minds of the public. Therefore, if you want to be a part of our association, you play by this set of rules and their benefits in being associated with us, and then trying to get uh, chemical companies in countries all around the world to sign on to those principles and to show some notable progress. Now, that doesn't stand in lieu of, of what needs to be done from a regulatory aspect, but it is a form of pressure that kind of fits in, I think, with, uh, what, with what could be uh, sort of the northern responsibility. Next question, please. I, I, I I, I have two brief questions. Um, um, the, 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 the first is, uh, what, what are your views on, on the legislation which, which is, has been proposed to elevate EPA to cabinet level? Um, do, you, do, you, do you think it's a good idea? What, pro what do you think its pros prospects are in Congress? And how independent should the EPA scientists be, given that the EPA science base is under criticism and, uh, and more independence would make it easier to recruit good scientists? The other is, um, what are your views on a consumption tax, given that it has um, fairly broad support among economists and uh, um, apparently is feasible administratively? Why don't we go down the line so that we don't lose the train of thought, go down the line or whoever wants to comment on briefly, briefly, on the elevation of EPA to cabinet level status. Anyone want to, they want to have, oh, oh. go ahead. No, well, I'm for <laughs> <laughs> That's a surprise. <laughs> no, I, I think what's happened is that um, this seems like a relatively non-controversial bill, as you know, was raised actually uh, in the previous administration as well. And I think because it was a non-controversial bill, it has attracted uh, a lot of uh, side issues. And in the last administration, there were different side issues than they are in this administration. I think what's curious now is that a coalition of folks who are very concerned with the use of risk assessment and economics in uh, in setting regulations has joined together fairly strongly with several other interest groups who are concerned about takings issues and um, what we call, uh, well, essentially impacts on uh, small communities. And they have put together a coalition that I guess they have 94, 95 votes in the Senate. Um, at this point, I think uh, it's really up for grabs whether there will be a compromise. It certainly is possible that there will be some compromise language on all three of those issues, which will in turn allow uh, passage. But it's, I think it's very much open issue. It's pleasant to note that if, if the elevation does take place, that two of our panelists will post hoc become uh, assistant secretaries in their experience rather than assistant administrators. <laughs> look forward to that. Um, on the second question, if I can clarify it for myself, the audience, and the panelists, the consumption tax, are you referring specifically to environmental taxes? And if so, to something more specific like the BTU pro tax no, proposal? No, no, I, I mean, of course, the, I, mean, I mean, there was a bit of this discussion of pollution taxes, but, but I, I was thinking of a more of a broader. Uh, a broad based consumption tax as yeah, an environmental policy instrument, presumably, since that's what we're well, discussing. Well, but, but, but also as a general, I, I mean, I, I mean, as a, uh, I, I mean, the, the, there are many economists who been arguing that, that, including Lawrence Summers, Martin Feldstein, several others, that, that, uh, that, that a consumption tax would be a good idea because it, it would uh, in, involve um, uh, taxing capital, okay, why don't capital, we move to capital and labor less. Thanks. Um, does anyone want to comment on the notion of increased use of consumption taxes in the U.S. as an environmental policy instrument or for any other reason? Um, I guess I can go ahead. Um, look, it's the, the notion that the, the, the aesthetic notion that we spend too much in 
who consume too much that we're using up the world, I think, is silly. But I, but I would like to see a consumption tax because I like to see a, to see savings increase. It's an incentive to save. And, but I, I don't quite know what that has to do with, precisely has to do with the environment. There are more specific taxes where you, so-called pagu taxes, where you try to tax externalities, um, and where you try to tax environmental externalities, which very desirable if you could figure out what the externalities were and measure them and get people to agree to do it. Yeah, I, I, I'm quite unpopular with a lot of my corporate clients on this one because uh, I am intrigued and uh, sympathetic to uh, a lot of the ideas on environmental taxes as well. You, had it, you heard it here tonight from me, Kim. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've actually written a paper with you on the subject, though, Rob. <laughs> um, <laughs> which got me in a lot of trouble. Um, if we can figure out a couple of things, and, and that is, if, is this just going to be one more tax, or is this a way to get rid of other bad taxes, uh, such as payroll taxes and other things where we're taxing goods, um, or is, is this just one more thing, or can we get rid of some other things? How are we going to set this tax? How are we going to value the externality? How are we going to think about the pollution control investments that we've already made so far? And then can we think through what are the transition costs associated with this as well, uh, much as we would need to think about with any environmental regulation? I think Dick has a brief yeah, I'll just say it. quickly, uh, I think Brad hit the nail on the head. Uh, nobody wants to pay more taxes. I think that's fairly clear. This has to be seen as a substitute for other taxes. And coming back to the, one of the earlier questions about win-win, essentially, uh, Dale Jorgensen and others who have uh, studied this problem have <coughs> demonstrated by model exercises that, in fact, you can have an aggregate win for the economy by removing deadweight loss from capital taxes and other phenomena, as well as an improvement in the uh, environment. And that's what I think the notion of win-win arises from. It's not really at the individual level. But consumption taxes are obviously an attractive way to do that. Can I, b before we come to you, just to keep the thread that's going, did, Paul, did you want to comment on that about the win-win, since you were the one that brought up the phrase, the win-win of these revenue neutral tax changes? We go to a consumption tax while cutting a labor or a capital investment tax. Let me take the easy way out. Yeah, you're going to have me back up here to Kennedy School on Friday to talk about this. I wasn't sure what I was going to say on Friday. I'm certainly not prepared to say what I think about it tonight. So. <laughs> <laughs> Except to recognize that it's an issue of some controversy. Yeah. Just uh, <laughs> See, someone asked earlier that we're complaining there was no disagreement among the panelists. I disagree with all of them, actually. <laughs> back on the consumption, <laughs> on the consumption tax. Uh, we have supported and will continue to push for a tax shift uh, policy. We support it in the context of a BTU tax or, or even more uh, preferably a, a, a carbon tax with, a, with an accompanying shift uh, reduction in, in payroll taxes. So we, we tax behavior that we would like to uh, have less of and uh, tax less the behavior that we'd like to have more of. NRDC was a very vocal supporter of the BTU tax proposals, I recall. With great success. Yes. <laughs> now we know. <laughs> um, this question goes back to the firm level, so maybe Brad um, would be best to address it first. The, for a lot of industries which are very capital intensive, the cost of environmental quality is really affected by where you are in your capital investment cycle. So we see two extremes, where 3M was at a really good point in their investment and they could sort of upgrade technologies and they got this great pollution prevention pays program. But the paper industry is really struggling because they just made a bunch of investments. Since you're looking at the firm level, how can we try and, and bring these two things together so that we begin to be smarter about the timing, um, looking more at the capital budgeting um, process? And, and what are you seeing of some of your firms that you're working with in terms of whether they're trying to do this? Is your question directed at? What, what we do with firms is help them think strategically about that set of decision, which may be something wholly apart from the policy prescription for what we'd I guess there are two questions. Right? I mean, one is from, you know, there are things that from a strategic standpoint you're encouraging your clients to do so that they're thinking about this at the right time. And then from a policy perspective, um, anybody else on the panel or whether you've thought about this just on the side, how can you begin to develop policy instruments that also encourage this yeah. Um. Well, l let me just make a comment or two about it at the firm level. What we talk with our, our clients about is you need to be looking at these sort of environmental de decisions on a much more systematic, dynamic, and comprehensive basis. It needs to be systematic in that you can't just be reacting to each new regulation that's coming down the line. Instead, you need to try to understand what are the forces at work going on in, the, in, in this industry uh, so that you're not caught 
having made your chunk of capital decisions two years ago when the Clean Water Act gets reauthorized this year and says you need to do something else. It needs to be dynamic in, in, in the sense as well, sort of similar to that, uh, systematic in that you're looking across all the issues and figuring out what's going on, dynamic in the sense of saying, well, let's not try to do this one today and the next one uh, two years from now and the next one there, that creeping in incrementalism, which is a real recipe for value destruction. And then most importantly, as a firm, you need to be looking at it much more uh, comprehensively and looking to the external markets. Too often firms are saying, woe is me uh, with these tough regulations coming down the pike when they don't realize that they are in fact advantaged relative to some of their industry uh, counterparts and that it may indeed be in their interest for tight regulations and that sort of thing. I think Paul Portney next and then Peter. Uh, let me throw an alley-oop lob pass to Dick Morgenstern for an easy slam dunk here. Uh, one, of the, one of the things I would say about EPA right now is that they're trying to be sensitive to exactly that point that you made because in opposition to the traditional approach of regulating on a pollutant by pollutant basis and going across industry groups, they're now putting together something called the cluster approach where they're looking at specific industries and saying what can we do for them, with them, to them on an air pollution, water pollution, toxic substance, hazardous waste basis. And that kind of approach would allow precisely the kind of sensitivity that you've talked about where you could recognize that in the paper industry they've just spent a ton of money on investment. This isn't the time to ask them to change over their capital stock. In another industry, they may be at the point where they've depreciated their capital, are going to have to replace plant and equipment, and this may be a good time to approach them with a whole series of technology-based standards. So you see that being the next step for the cluster rules because the paper cluster rules that just came out weren't able to do that. They were able to bring together air and water, but not get in sync with the industry's capital investment making. Uh, Dick and Dave well, Hawkins are I probably think that was the better first step. To, um, yeah. I think one of the interesting examples is, is some of you have heard about the experience at Amico, it's been recently well publicized, where they did a study. It was not any form of regulatory change, just a study, which showed that there were vast opportunities to make changes at a site specific uh, situation. And what we're now trying to do is to uh, build on that phenomenon, which we believe exists in many uh, different companies in many situations, and try to design a process, much as Paul said, where in fact there'll be some form of negotiation and site-specific determination of a kind of custom-tailored, kind of like you know one size doesn't fit all. It's really a custom-tailored situation, uh, and I think the real uh, uh, focus that Carol Browner has put on this is that she wants to have. Uh, I think it has been cast in the past as a bit of a regulatory relief effort. Well, we can help out some companies that are stuck with in some tough situations. I think she's looking for an opportunity to have a clear gain for the environment as well as reduce costs, and we believe we can do that. Before we go to the next question, I want to mention that as a result of that comment now, all of our other panelists also have an opportunity and a right to praise their boss publicly. <laughs> next uh, question. My question is directed uh, primarily, though not exclusively at all, to uh, Mr. Hawkins. Um, my question is, uh, does the growing realization in the compatibility or the possible compatibility of uh, the environment and the economy require a fresh approach from a legal, legal perspective um, where you had this dichotomy um, between sort of advocacy organizations uh, like NRDC and, you know, quote unquote pro firm or pro business um, legal firms sort of battling it out? Um, are there new tools that lawyers can use? constructively to try to promote this idea that um, there's compatibility? Uh, good question. The uh, NRDC uh, brings lots of lawsuits, but actually it's the tool of last resort. Uh, we, uh, we bring lawsuits when, uh, when uh, we think that uh, the law clearly requires something and, and either EPA or a firm is doing the opposite. Um, uh, what we've been doing a lot of, and with with some uh, good results, is uh, what is a form of a, a, an alternative dispute resolution technique called regulatory negotiation. Um, and it, it's interesting, and it uh, we've been participating a lot in these regulatory negotiations. We're essentially people from uh, the industry, state uh, groups, um, uh, user groups, um, and the, the federal government, and environmental groups get around a table before a rule is written and try to see if they can sit down and say, okay, uh, let's see if we can come up with a rule that all of us can live with. Uh, and the benefits are that, that you uh, reduce or eliminate the uh, need for litigation. I've just finished um, a long uh, negotiation with uh, the utility industry where we uh, 
Uh, they filed a lawsuit against EPA's acid rain rules. We filed a lawsuit against EPA's acid rain rules, and we've just sat down and, and worked out something. I can't tell you about the details tonight, but uh, in a couple of weeks it probably uh, is something that can be talked about. Um, and we all agreed on an outcome because uh, we thought it was better than continuing the litigation for, for uh, many additional uh, years. Now, just a couple of points about it, because uh, this doesn't happen easily, uh, and this might be an interesting issue about uh, uh, in, does environmental advocacy and economics go together? Um, because if we bring a lawsuit, uh, our time is compensated for uh, in attorney's fees. If we sit down and do a regulatory negotiation, it isn't, um, and which sends some confusing signals to an organization that still has to pay its bills. Um, nonetheless, we feel that there's enough merit in this that we are spending hours of uncompensated time negotiating things rather than uh, hours of, uh, of compensating time uh, uh, litigating them. Although surely partnerships between the Environmental Defense Fund and McDonald's did not hurt EDF in terms of fundraising. So I think there are financial incentives to that, right? right. Does anyone else, any Anybody else have a comment on the sort of fresh approach that the legal uh, profession could take to uh, this issue? See, Dave's the only lawyer here. Yeah. So, mm. so let's go to the next slide, please. Yeah. Um. Well, I was just going to say on the partnership point, because we, we had an opportunity to look at the, the, the role and opportunity for environmental partnerships across different kinds of stakeholder groups. And it is an intriguing and potentially high value concept to be pushing forward on. But un unfortunately, uh, we're going to have a real problem with institutional capacity of organizations like NRDC and Environmental Defense Fund and others who, unfortunately, the bench isn't that deep and the coffers are not that full so that we can't be looking to that really as a model of, a, of, of the new way uh, and the new form of cooperation on a lot of these matters, which is lamentable. Next question over here. Yeah. Um, one thing that flowed from the discussion um, of the idea of win-win is that um, on an aggregate level, um, it might be a valid construct, but that when looking at a more regionally based um, focus, the trade-offs between environment and economics are very clear. And the question that I'd like to ask to the panelists is um, how can economic insights theory um, and expertise in general be, to, be brought to bear on the management of these more regionally based conflicts that are associated with environmental policy decisions? Um, I suppose national level would be a good place, but I'd also be interested in some thoughts on uh, what can be done on the international level, say, um, given the fact that it's going to cost China a whole lot to um, reduce their CO2 emissions relative to some other countries. Anyone? Dick, yeah, yeah I would just mention two points on that. Uh, in the case of the BTU tax, the ill-fated BTU tax, there was a lot of consideration given to compensating the obvious losers, which would be people who were at the low end of the income scale. And in fact, there was an aggressive program put together. And curiously, that program was enacted, and the BTU tax was not. <laughs> but there was thought that went into it at the time. Uh, on the international scale, I mentioned earlier that the compensation that was really offered to developing countries in the area of uh, climate change, uh, the, con the whole concept of joint implementation, which many of you have probably heard about, is really a way of uh, potentially uh, taking situations where there are obligations on rich countries where they might face higher cost obligations and giving them an opportunity uh, in a properly audited and properly every kind of open uh, environment to uh, to potentially make investments which could create uh, favorable opportunities in developing countries for the developing countries themselves. Peter. You know, this economists are, gonna, are really going to mess, are really messing around with this stuff now. There's going to be a paper coming out in the American Economic Review this fall, uh, which is, I think, the first serious attempt to project the, the, lo the winners and losers from uh, climate change. Um, and, you know, there are a lot of winners, a lot of winners. Um, nothing like a little global warming to improve the crops in Canada. Um, in fact, with, even within the, this is a, very, a first very serious analysis. Uh, even within the United States, there are dramatic differences in between winners and losers. And believe me, if once once people focus on their on their interests in these things, it's going to be very hard to imagine the deals whereby we compensate the losers. Anything else? Uh, yes. Uh, just to repeat, um, there are no win-win policies. There's always some poor schlemiel that loses when you do away with a thoroughly stupid policy. That's why thoroughly stupid policies have almost infinite lifetimes in the US <laughs> government. So please keep that in mind. Um, I just want to reiterate something. I want to reiterate something that, 
I'm always worried when the audience applauds. Um, I want to reiterate something that Peter said. If I could give advice to aspiring young policy analysts, I think one of the most important things for people to work on is the development of, of policies and programs that compensate the people that would lose when you do away with inefficient programs like any, any of the subsidies you were taught to in your classes every single day. The problem is you've got an entrenched group of people that benefit from that. If there's a way to buy them out with some of the net gains that society as a whole will recognize, then we can sort of move on and do away with wasteful subsidies, put in place regulatory programs for which benefits are well in excess of costs. And, it's, and yet in policy schools and certainly in economics programs, virtually no time and attention is devoted to the design of these kinds of programs. You haven't been in my class lately, Paul, or you would have heard that. Next question. Yes, I'd like to ask the panel to address cooperative economic structures. It seems to me that in the area of agriculture and retail um, sale, that they've, um, cooperative structures have been very useful in providing competitively priced um, products produced that have also, to, consumer, those, to consumers that have also been produced in an environmentally conscious way. And I was wondering if the panel could comment first on any other areas or sectors of the economy where such structures exist, um, and also the likelihood um, and plausibility of developing them further. Would anyone like to come? Well, rural electric co-ops certainly haven't had that, that effect. <laughs> Some of them are the most intransigent in terms of uh, resisting pollution control. But uh, um, uh, certainly, the, you know, this, maybe this the small is good uh, 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 approach to things uh, and closer to the, closer to the, to the source uh, uh, will uh, let people realize that they really aren't able to externalize uh, because they're going to be living in the, in the area affected by uh, um, uh, their own practices. Uh, so I don't know that they necessarily go together. Other comments? Yeah. yeah. Actually, rural co-ops uh, uh, are really indicative of two, two of the topics we just talked about. One the is the co-op and the other is the subsidy. Right. And some of their intransigence may flow from the subsidy side as well. It's a bit of a stretch, but uh, thinking about cooperatives and cooperative relationships, I'm going to extrapolate up to large corporations again where I spend the time on. But there is, I think we're finding enormous potential and value from cooperative on the R&D side and pushing and making some of the investments and stuff you otherwise wouldn't uh, by doing it collectively. So it's not directly to the question, but uh, things like industry cooperatives for ozone layer protection and others. Uh, has enormous potential. We need to foster more of that type of collaboration. I see uh, John Graham and others that I know patiently standing behind the in the lines of the microphones, but I regret to say that because we're running out of time, this is going to be the last question. Uh, I, I better make it good. Um, part of the problem in formulating policies and defining solutions agreeable to various constituencies deals with differences in definitions of timelines that people are looking at. There's environmentalists who are looking 50 years and longer when they're talking about solutions. Um, politicians who have four-year electoral cycles or shorter terms, and corporations who are accountable in annual meetings to their shareholders annually or in quarterly reports. Um, are they talking past each other? And is there a problem in their trying to define solutions together? If so, how can that be resolved or how can we work toward resolving that? Who would like to take a first shot at this? Couldn't we have stopped at the question before that? <laughs> I, that's, a tough, that's a tough one. Well, the, 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 you're right, different people have different timelines and perspectives, but if there's one group or uh, one group that has two faces, I guess, to it, that, that gets to define its own timeline uh, are consumers and voters. And, uh, and what we don't have is a system here where con consumers are demanding a set of products that are environmentally more benign, and therefore we put business managers in difficult predicaments of having to make trade-offs and realizing that if I want to do this now, it's going to cost me money, and therefore I have to take the short-term attitude. And similarly, we don't have voters who are requiring uh, of their legislators and regulators to, to make the, the longer-run decisions. Now, how do we get at that? I guess you can take the, the real long-run view, and it starts with education programs and so on. Um, but it, it, it's hard to point the blame solely at at, uh, at the business people or the government, uh, the government representatives and such, when the problem is are those those of us uh, who are voting with our wallets and uh, 
and how we're, uh, you know, our behaviors in those ways. Um, I'm going to go to Peter. Yeah, I would say also, if anything, politicians, you might think politicians would be afraid of environmental change because they got to get reelected every two, four, eight years, whatever that. I think it's worked the other way so far that they, that Congress has planted dozens of time bombs, environmental time bombs out there. Um, to uh, toxic waste um, in general is a big one. Um, all, sorts of, all sorts of laws were passed and the politicians who passed them no longer have any, will no longer be rise or fall by, by their cost or their effectiveness. Uh, so that um, if you like the fact that we, we've got on the books some remarkably stringent environmental rate laws that will, that will go into effect in the future, uh, then you should be happy about this lack of, lack of accountability. Uh, Dave and then Paul. Yeah, well, uh, that, uh, the last point about timelines, uh, we don't have to be uh, talking past uh, one another in terms of these timelines. Uh, another negotiation I'm involved in uh, is with the paint industry. We're trying to uh, come up with a structure to, to reformulate paints to reduce the smog producing chemicals that are in the paints. Uh, and we, uh, have dis we have come close to agreeing on and may ev eventually agree on a structure which will set in place a, a set of uh, performance standards that um, in three stages. The first stage kicks in in 1996, another stage kicks in in the year 2000, and a third stage kicks in in the year <coughs> 2004. Um, and they are, as you would expect, progressively more stringent. And um, uh, this is uh, uh, deliberately intended to uh, try to deal with the fact that with enough time uh, they, they can hit these targets uh, and um, with good enough targets we're prepared to give, uh, give the time. Uh, an interesting side consequence on this is that we tried to get the industry to accept an emission charge that would have the effect of producing this uh, uh, desire to move toward ever uh, cleaner products, uh, but they just weren't willing to bite. They wanted the security of command and control tables of standards. Paul, you're going to get the next to the last word. Okay, well, let, let me go out on a bit of a limb here and suggest that uh, I, I don't necessarily think that businessmen and women are the short-sighted imbeciles that they're often made out to be. Um, now, I'm, I'm certainly not going to say that, that they... I'm certainly not going to say that U.S. industry should be applauded for its long-term view of things, but, but the truth is, I mean, if one looks at investment in research and development by corporate America each year, they spend a hell of a lot of money on that, and these are things that won't pay off in one year, two years, sometimes even in five years. Um, second, whether we like it or not, and, and we can argue about how well it works, there is a market for corporate control in the United States. And if all of these companies were behaving in a very short-sighted way, and making decisions on the basis of the next year and ignoring opportunities to make tons of money if they'd only look five years down the line, then there are people who make very good livings acquiring companies like that and forcing them to look two years, five years, 10 years down the line. Again, I'm not gonna suggest that the market for corporate control results in wringing out all of the inefficiencies that currently exist, but there is a mechanism so that companies that are excessively short-sighted no longer have the managers that they currently have who manifest this short-sightedness. Uh, we have heard tonight, uh, over the last hour and 15 minutes, uh, a fairly wide variety of perspectives uh, on the question of this relationship between the economy and the environment. I guess one thing that seems clear is that there is not an obvious consensus, although it also seems relatively clear that if there is an ultimate truth with regard to the questions about this relationship between economy and environment, it's probably that it lies somewhere between what are the extremes that we tend to hear about on television or read about in the newspapers. No, the economy and the environment don't seem to be fundamentally incompatible. But on the other hand, we've also heard that there are some fundamental trade-offs between the two that do frequently exist. Uh, where this may leave us in terms of public policy is with what is perhaps only a modest suggestion. Uh, that's one, to do a better job of establishing our environmental priorities among the many environmental problems we tend to be concerned with. And number two, to do a better job of designing policy instruments that achieve our environmental goals with as small an economic sacrifice as is possible. Uh, with that, I want to conclude by thanking our uh, panelists, David Hawkins, Richard Morgenstern, Bradley Whitehead, Peter Passell, and Paul Portney. A little earlier, I joked that I disagreed with all of them, but the fact is it's been a delight for me to be able to moderate this panel.
because I'm actually a member of the fan club of each of them. As you've heard tonight, they're not only the most knowledgeable, but also the mar most articulate representatives one could come up with from the various sectors that they actually represent. Uh, so thanks to them, and finally, thanks very much to all of you for your attention, uh, your questions, your discussion, and most important of all, your consideration of these very important issues. Good night. Thank you.